I go for refuge and from enlightened to the Buddha, the Dharma, the Sangha, by my accumulations for practice of giving and so forth, may I become a Buddha to benefit all sentient beings. I go for refuge and from enlightened to the Buddha, the Dharma, the Sangha. <coughs> May I become a Buddha to benefit all sentient beings. I go for refuge and to enlightened to the Buddha, the Dharma, the Sangha, by my accumulations for practice of giving and so forth. May I become a Buddha to benefit all sentient beings. Sanye Jodha Zoghe Jonanda Janjo Bando Dane Gyapsunche Dage Jin Soke Be Sonan Dola Benjir Sanye Dubara Shom Sanye Jodha Zoghe Jonanda Janjo Bando Dane Gyapsunche Dage Jin Soke Be Sonan Ge Dola Benjir Sanye Dubara Shom Sanye Joda Zoge Jonanda, Janjo Bando Dane Gyapsuche, Dage Jin Soke Bersonan, Dola Benjir Sanye Dubaraisho. Om Ye Dharama Hetu Pradavan, he tum te sham da tha ga to yavatat te sham chayo niroda eva bhati mahasramana yeswaha Om ye dharama he tu pradavan he tum te sham da tha ga to yavatat te sham jayo niroda evam vati mahasramana yeswaha Om ye dharama he tu pradavam He tum te sham da tha ga to yavatat Te sham chayo niroda Evam vati mahasramana yeswa Om ye dharama he tu prabhavan He tum te sham da tha ga to yavatat Te sham chayo niroda Evam vati mahasramana yeswaha All phenomena arise from causes. The causes are taught by the Tathagata. The cessation of causes as well is taught by the great seer. Profound, peaceful, elaborate, and free, clear light man, non composite. Such is the nectar that I have discovered. Finding no one who can fathom this teaching, in silence I'll return to the words. Beyond our true thought and expression is a professional wisdom, which is unborn, unseized, and has an initial space. It's all the way apprehension of self realized wisdom to you, the mother of the Buddhas, of the three times of the obeisance. All composite things are impermanent, all contaminated things are the nature of suffering, all phenomena are the nature of emptiness and selflessness. Transcending sorrow is peace. The Guru is the Buddha, like the Guru is Dharma, likewise the Guru is the Sangha. The Guru is also everything wholesome. I go for refuge in the Guru. By the sound of the vibrant drum of Dharma, you liberate all beings of miseries. I beseech you to kindly remain and give teachings until the end of the expense of billions of eons. The Buddha does not watch the negative videos of the beings, nor does he remove their miseries by his hands. His spiritual realizations are not transferred to them. It is by teaching the truth of the suchness that the beings are liberated. With folded hands, I beseech the Buddhas of all directions to shine light of Dharma, miseries glow. If you are attached to this line, you are not a spiritual practitioner. If you are attached to samsara, you have no renunciation. If you are attached to your own self-interest, you have no bodhicitta. If there is trust in you, do not have the view. Deyata vongate 
गते पार गते पार संगते बोधि स्वाध्या ओम गते गते पार गते पार संगते बोधि स्वाध्या ते पार गते पार संगते बोधि स्वाध्या ओम गते गते पार गते पार संगते बोधि स्वा ओके ये सीधे पर भी लंच इज दैट दे सेम ऑल फिनमिना लाइक दिवास दिवास द फ्लावर or the rosary, all phenomena uh, should necessarily have many characteristics. In fact, infinite number of characteristics. This is what I've learned. And how do we separate these characteristics? That the object and its characteristics, whether they are same or different, whether the one or different, for that we need to know entity-wise, unsuited-wise. Entity-wise, the object and its characteristics are all same entity but isolated wise they are different isolates this is what we will learn number one so from this what we say is that the um the, for example the vase the vase and the the the, the, the vase is empty of let's say vase is not a chocolate vase not a chocolate that is the characteristic of the vase likewise this vase is empty of being a chocolate. This vase is empty of being objective reality. This vase is empty of object reality. So this vase being empty of object reality is known as emptiness. So we see that the vase and the emptiness of the vase, these two are not one. Isolated wise, these two are different. But entity wise, these two are the same. Isolated wise, these two are different. This is what we learned. And say this vase is a positive phenomena or negative phenomena. Vase is a positive phenomena, negative phenomena. Positive phenomena. The emptiness of the vase is positive phenomena, negative phenomena. Negative phenomena. Affirming negative. Non-affirming negative. Non-affirming negative. Okay. So the vase is positive phenomena and the Emptiness of the vase is a negative phenomena, particularly non-affirming negative. So knowing that, we see that positive phenomena and negative phenomena, these two cannot be identical. So therefore, these two are separate, these two are different. But say the entity-wise, these two are the same. Isolated-wise, these two are different. And uh, so when we say emptiness, when you measure emptiness, if the pot comes to your mind, this is a positive phenomenon, it's not emptiness. So emptiness, when it comes to your mind, it should come in the form of non-affirming negative. If it comes in the form of a positive phenomenon, it's not emptiness. For example, let's say that the, uh, the same, do you agree with me that what is seen as beautiful flower here, but it's not really beautiful, is it? Right? There's some must have more beautiful flowers. Right? Off seasons. So no flowers around. Yeah. Okay. So let's say this beautiful flower. So this flower, do you agree with me agree with me that this is nothing but made of say the millions of cells? This is made of millions of cells. 
and um, the it looks so nice but if you're subject to the say the electron microscope first of all what we see is that the what is seen as so the texture wise so nice it's so nice very tender and nice when subject subject the same tender flower under the electron microscope you see that the initially you see you start to see the cracks like the dry mud dry clay like cracks what are the cracks these are the cell membranes partition between the cells cell membranes then if through further fine-tuning the electron microscope you start seeing the cells visible and through further fine-tuning the electron microscope you see the nucleus inside the cells cytoplasm cell membrane and the nucleus through further fine-tuning the electron microscope and the nucleus you'll see that inside the are the chromosomes and the chromosomes they don't look beautiful chromosomes if you look at it through electron microscope you see that it's like a very dry brownish a snake like structure it's not at all beautiful and in many cases it may seem more be say repulsive and where's the flower it appears so beautiful the same object through electron microscope when you see on the chromosome level it's uh, not at all beautiful okay through further fine tuning this electron microscope then the, even the chromosomes you see that it's nothing but made of dna molecules and the dna molecules are made of atoms and the atoms they are not beautiful they are not repulsive atoms are neutral you agree with me okay so the same object which initially triggered attachment to you at one point change your perception it triggered fear it triggered uneasiness it triggered i say the repulsion in your mind and the same object on it on the atomic level is neutral no attachment no aversion no pleasant feeling no unpleasant feeling you're getting it so the same object what makes the same object gives you three different and uh, the say the emotional states attachment aversion and neutral feeling why how come that the same object gives three different the emotions anyone yes so how your mind perceives it it's not the object per se it's your mind you perceive in one way it gives you attachment yeah the it perceives it in another way as like the chromosomes like a striped brownish of the snakes it gives a feel of the, the aversion and then just see the, the on the atomic level is just neutral so this is how it's not the object per se it's how you view things that the your emotional states are stirred accordingly so from this um the what we learn is that the um the same object can be seen in three different ways and they, these three are I say these three are there's a discrepancy there in terms of the, the, the three different perceptions. There's a discrepancy, there's a gap in ways you perceive the same object depending on how you perceive it. So which of the three perceptions are correct? The how you see this is flowers correct, or the chromosomes is correct, or the atoms is correct? Huh? All are correct. How many you would say the all are correct? <laughs> who said it? Pablo? No, who said it? All are incorrect. Uh, Not okay, the uh, the Abhishek. Okay. All are incorrect. So this morning you're, you're seeing breakfast is incorrect. Uh -huh. So uh, tomorrow no breakfast for Abhishek. <laughs> because it's incorrect. You're getting it okay so which is correct which is correct anyone huh? no this no this is not my question whether subject or not subject this is my question my question is which of the three perceptions is correct okay all three are all three are correct, all three are correct. And then, uh, 
And the problem was particularly with like which is pretty much stuck to a lot. And finally at the very, very uh, minute neutral feeling. So which means that the Dormanism, all, all three are correct. All three are correct, right? If I ask you how, then you can say depends on. <laughs> okay, so the, um, how many agree with Dormanism results? All three are correct, yes, all three are correct. Okay, um, what about those people who did not raise hands? Raise hands? <laughs> raise hands, so those who did not raise hands. Why did you not raise hands? Here, why? Why not? You agree, not agree? Partially? You don't agree. Which means, what, what, what do you say? Huh? All three perceptions are wrong? Oh, all three perceptions are wrong. So, tomorrow, two breakfast free. <laughs> tomorrow, we have two breakfasts. Okay, so we can save two breakfasts. Okay, here. Yeah, I think neutral is the correct one. The first thing is the flower is wrong. No, no, no. Say, uh, let me put it like this. By the way, your name? Tayo. 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 Okay, let's say that the uh, same attachment to the flower. <clears throat> how many how many you love flowers resents? Love flowers many how many you are crazy after flowers? <laughs> Raise hands. Okay, how many you flowers also resents? Some people, you know, what is this? Look, there's a flower there. <laughs> Look at this, there's a flower there. Look at the curtains, there are flowers there. Every flower. What is this? <laughs> Some people they're they're disgusted to see flowers everywhere. Even the, the, even the cloth's flower. Even this was also a flower. Every flower is a flower. Every flower. Right? Okay. Some people say, that, wow, so beautiful this flower. Flower, flower, everywhere is flower. So beautiful. Okay, let's say we have two groups. One who just. Every so look at this flower. Come and look at this, this flower. And even the book must be the flower. <laughs> Who is the flower? No flower? Are you sure? The book. Yes, there's a flower there. So what I'm saying is, let's say that there's one group who's extremely crazy after flowers. Another group fed up with flowers. Two groups. Group A, group B. I ask group A and group B. Okay. Who are so so with flowers with hands? So so with flowers. So so with flowers, not hate, not crazy. So so, okay. Those who are crazy after flowers, raise hands. <laughs> okay. Now I ask, what is this? Hey, group A. Those who are so so with the flower, what is this? Okay, Kayo, don't forget it. They have no attachment, but they see still this. They see this as a flower. Group B, crazy after flowers. What is this? Huh? Flowers. So, do you do, do you notice that? Did you notice that in both cases they say that the answer is the same? What is this? This is a flower. My next question: How nice is this? Those so so will say so so, <laughs> and those who are crazy flowers is beautiful. You're getting it. So only when I ask you to describe it, how nice is it? Then the answers diverge. But cognitively, when I ask, what is this? It's, I'm just asking, I'm, I'm just uh, cognitively asking what it is. So your cognitive response is that this is a flower. You're getting it? Whether you like it or not, in both cases, the answer remains the same, that this is a flower. If you say that this is chocolate, this is total disaster. So whereas this is a flower, this is correct. But when I say, how nice is that? Then the answer is made. Diverge. Some will say this is nice, some will say this is not nice, how you I say describe it. But that yeah, this being a flower, everybody agrees. You're getting it? But when you look at it through electromicroscope, 
You see that this one's flower D, it's just atoms. You're getting it? So here, by changing your the by changing your perception, first look at the same object through electron microscope, no sorry, through a naked eyes, and then they're shifting from naked eyes to the electron microscope, you see this is just a bunch of atoms, a pool of atoms. There's no flower there. But those who are looking at this through electron through, through naked eyes, you see this is a beautiful flower. And others will say that there's no flower, there's just a bunch of atoms. Okay. So do you see that the same object can be viewed in two different ways, and you are, yet you cannot deny one to be wrong and one is right. Both are correct, right? The way Dr. Monalisa said, that both perceptions are correct. Seeing this as a flower by naked eyes is also correct, and seeing this as full of atoms is also correct. Is it correct or not? What do you think? Okay. If both are correct, but you see that there's a discrepancy there discrepancy in the appearance. One sees this as a flower, and the second it sees that there's no flower there. There's no flower, just pool of atoms. That's it. And, and how many of you are oftentimes deceived by this discrepancy? That things appear in one way, and actually the reality is very different, and you are disillusioned by that later on. How many of you had that experience? Raise hands. Huh? How many of their experience? Okay. Ah, yes. This is what many people are deceived. Appearance and the reality is very different, right? Okay. I don't want to go too much into this part. Uh, you, you have your own experience, right? In your life, you have experienced that. For example, I remember that the uh, people on the seashore, on the beach, on the beach, from distance, they, they saw a very strange phenomena, which they have never seen before. Some, you know, something like, so usually the waves come. Waves come, the waves are visible only when it comes closer towards you. From distance, you don't really see that. Maybe like a thin white, uh, thin white line. You can see that from distance. And when it comes closer, it is a wave. So, uh, some of these people, what they noticed was something not a, little, a thin one, a white light. It was some huge, massive thing from distance. And they were so fascinated. Wow, there's a beautiful structure. We have never seen this before. Some people. Saying this, they ran away. And some people they go closer to that. What is that? Huh? Raise hands. Yes. Tsunami. <laughs> you are getting it? Yes. Tsunami appears so beautiful from distance. So beautiful. So people, some of the people who want they want to see it closer. They want to go closer. And some people who are smart, who know that this is not this is not beautiful, it can kill you. They ran away. Only few people ran away, and only most of the people they got stuck there. They just described that, and within few seconds they were all sucked. The first washed away, and then sucked up in the ocean. <clears throat> it's a huge tsunami. Okay, so. This is what this morning I shared with the, the people who attended uh, the morning practice. Okay. And um, this was what the Buddha taught. Buddha gave the metaphor of like 100 people, 100 people coming for a picnic along the river bank, bank of a river. And uh, they end. Out of hundred, only about two or three people, they just they looking looking at the the flow of the river. They could see some pattern there, and they could sense that this is not a good sign. It's not a good sign. There's no time for us to do. Or there's no time for picnic. We have to try to run away, try to cross the river. Otherwise, soon it'll kill us. And these three people, 
They're working so hard to cross the river, telling, warning others, please don't, we have no time for picnic, we have to run, otherwise this will flood and it will kill us. And the 99 people out of the 100, they said, you are spoiling our picnic, right? Even the cross, cross, but don't disturb us. You are spoiling a picnic. And they kept picnicking. And then the two of them managed to escape. And within like 20 minutes, a huge flood came and all the 97 people were killed by the flood. So this is a metaphor the Buddha gave for the samsaric beings. How the samsaric beings, they are constantly being infatuated, constantly being trapped by the bait of the samsaric happiness. And actually these are the tsunamis killing us, one of the other, one of the other, one of the other. Only a few people, only a few people sense that this is a tsunami, this is not a beautiful structure, this is not a beautiful view, it's a tsunami in the air, we have to do things, we have to put effort to run away from this, escape from this, and how to escape? See the reality, emptiness, there's nothing really from the object, it's all coming from your subject, you realize from the object is empty, only with this realization you are freed from the, the dream of the samsara. Okay. So for this, the, uh, we need to know the, the reality that what is seen is so beautiful structure from our, from distance. And this is not a beautiful structure, it is a tsunami that is going to kill you and kill thousands of people. So how do you know the reality of this, that this is not a beautiful structure, it is very ferocious nature. So there is nothing really there from the object, it is all coming from the subject. How do I know this? So this is known as the introduction to emptiness. Okay, so for this, it's so important for us, before we plunge into the concept of emptiness, which is so, so precious, and Ari Nigarjuna's direct disciple, the Bodhisattva Ari Deva, uh, what he said is that his text, 400 verses, eventually I would highly recommend all of us to study this text, 400 verses, by the great teacher, Bodhisattva Ari Deva. In Tibetan, Pavala. Yes, Pavala. Okay. So what he said is that that those with less merit will not even have a doubt in this teaching on emptiness. Let me repeat it. Those with less merit will not even have a doubt in this teaching on the ultimate reality. Should a doubt ever arise in you, it will shatter your samsara into pieces. Let me repeat it. Those with less merit will not even have a doubt in this teaching on the ultimate reality. Should a doubt ever arise within you, it will shatter your samsara into pieces. So what is that doubt? Doubt not in the form of the skepticism. Doubt in the form of inquiry. What I'm saying do they really reflect the reality? Is this the reality? What I'm saying is this reality? Okay, just tell me how many of you, once in a lifetime, um, this question came to you. Once in a lifetime, you under, under any situation, sometimes, what I'm saying is this the reality? Raise hands. You had such experiences? Very good. This is so precious. So precious. In fact, I personally would say that uh, the... Um, that I must be aged, I think, about like 11 or 12 in school, the boarding school, and of course, my parents was. And those days, most of the, my generation, the Tibetans, we were the financially extremely poor, and the, the children, of course, not only poor that my mother passed away when I was five years old and my father, he was really struggling for his life. And uh, the, the, we were in school and those children with, uh, with their parents, they left for holidays, winter, two months holiday. And uh, then we were in the school, just like, you know, very lucky though, that at least there's a place for us to stay. And we have been fed and then the, so one time we were in the school hall, but for some group prayers, 
all the small children. And uh, it so happened that the uh, the school installed a fluorescent light, street light, fluorescent street light outside. The color was a little what orange orange color. And the I remember that me as a young boy, age eleven or twelve, had a, what a, the a jacket, a jacket, the color I don't remember. It must be it must be blue. And then going out, I saw that the, the, the jacket color is like, what is that? Maroon? No, the purple. What happened to my jacket? What happened jacket? The blue has become purple. What happened? Then I realized that it was the optical delusion. Optical delusion. That I was just checking. It's just, then it questioned it gave me a big question that which means so i'm seeing this as early as a blue is also questionable whether it's actually blue or not what i'm seeing now as like um, the purple it's not purple it was blue and still if i put this in the, the daylight it'll be seen as blue but well, now it is no way it's blue every way is purple so it's, it's not the reality which means even in the daytime what i see if the daytime is blue, whatever, whatever the color, if that is not the, the real color, how can I so know that this is a, what is the real color? This hit me when I was just 11 years old because of this incident. So likewise, in your own life, you must have come across these situations. For example, who, someone who looks so nice, <laughs> who looks a divine, right? With whom, if I spend time, then the I'll get already. I have hundred percent of my freedom. Now another hundred percent will come to me. Two hundred percent freedom will come to me. And actually, when you work together, then you lose your fifty percent freedom. And what you see, what you saw earlier, was very, very deceptive. It was not there, right? Okay, this is reality. So you discover the discrepancy between the appearance and the reality, right? So there are so many layers, there are so many of these versions of the discrepancy between appearance and the reality. Okay. So the, uh, with this, the, once you discover the reality, say for example, even with human relationship, or even going to a place, or even for a food, or anything, when you know the discrepancy between appearance and reality, then you become more grounded, that you are not being deceived by the appearance. Otherwise, it's very complicated. But recently, there was a, a young girl and who said that, the, I need to meet you. I said, okay, so no hurry, we can meet later. And she said, I'm not too sure if I'll be here uh, from tomorrow. I said, what decides whether you'll be here or not? She said that your talk will decide. Your talk will decide whether she should stay. Yeah. I said, okay, then come. Then she said that the, she's in a relationship. It's very complicated. And I said that, the, who put you together? Who put you two together? Right? Did he force you? She said, no. So, as long as you hold the fire, the fire will keep burning you. If you know there is fire, let go of it, right? Don't complain. It's you who is holding the fire. So, this is what I told her, right? Nobody is forcing you to keep the fire in your hand. Is it burning? Let it go. So, because that, you know, say they're being they're so naive to see the appearance. And you expect everything's divine. The reality is very everybody's suffering. It's not only you. Everybody's suffering. Even the other person is also suffering. So we have to know this reality. And on that basis, don't expect that, you know, that you will have divinity everywhere, divine everywhere. Right? So the reality is we have to discover the reality. If you know the reality, then you will be more grounded. Your life will be more easy. Right? You will not fall, okay, this is reality, with this reality, if I, you know, say for example, in a place where there's no water, this is reality. If you don't, it's so beautiful, beautiful sunlight, clean air, but there's no water there, let's say. There's no water, 
there you're being so unrealistic then you would think of settling there after settling there, everything investing every you, you then you realize there's no water there you cannot survive it's all because of you failing to see the reality so we have to see the reality and then the the subtlest of the reality unfolding which will free you will give you real freedom real nirvana is the emptiness of objectivity, emptiness of objectivity of the object. This is the final reality. If you discover this, if you get a glimpse of this, if you get a glimpse that what I'm seeing is not reality, objective, there's nothing there. If you get a glimpse, instantly it is reflected in your physiology. Physiologically, you will feel that the, say, the, the physiological responses, they will instantly calm down you can feel the tranquility and from this you can conjecture that if i practice this more if i go into more extensive studies reflection meditation with this then nirvana is 100 percent possible this confidence will come to you this is so so precious and alongside the empty subjectivity then subjective existence dependently everything exists when you realize this then you see that your compassion can really expand infinitely. No matter what situation arises, your compassion expands to the extent that you see yourself as a mother, then all the other sentient beings are like small children suffering in the form of anger, ego, bullying each other, domestic violence. And then on the last scale, see, they're creating so much of chaos, wars, border tensions, and so forth. These are all like small children. Like the, in the, there's an English expression which says, a person in the glass, glass house, hey, a, plus, a person in a glass house should not throw stones, right? This is the definition of small child. That you take shelter in this glass house and you break this, you throw the stone to break this, the glass house. This is how all the small children like the, the world leaders, they behave, creating all the tensions. Creating the tensions, how much money is invested, billions and trillions of dollars invested. Just imagine if all these leaders, they are like His Holiness the Dalai Lama, they will never fight. They will come together. They will think of constructing, not destructing the world. So all these trillions of dollars can be invested for education, for help, and for the, say, the, the hospitals, for all the, the noble the purposes and it's a huge amount of money where the world can be where we can see the world can thrive on a basis of this the amount of the money otherwise wasted by these all these leaders so this is because of their failure to see the discrepancy between the reality and the appearance okay so for this the understanding the or unfolding unfolding of the the, the unfolding of this discrepancy, there are so many layers of unfolding of the discrepancy, discrepancy with no appearance in the reality. This unfolding, discovery of this discrepancy with no appearance in reality, unfolding which will give you the total freedom is the emptiness of object of existence. This is known as emptiness. So for that matter, we need to know what emptiness is. But there's always a great, great tendency that in the process of you in search, you searching for this emptiness, you can easily slip into nihilism. You can easily slip into nihilism. So for that matter, we should be extremely, extremely, extremely careful to make sure that you don't slip into nihilism. For that matter, what is required is that we need extensive studies that, okay, if this happens, this is remedy. If that happens, this is remedy. This happens only through your extensive studies. There is no shortcut. So the wisdom of emptiness must be studied. Don't expect that somebody, a guru, will come to you, touch your head, bless you, and tomorrow you realize emptiness. Don't expect this. If you expect this, and you may think that, wow, you know, how come that he's so, he, he's so pessimistic, you know? That he's not positive. You know, he's not giving us encouragement to receive blessings from the Guru. 
so that I can wear the same things the next day, right? He's dissuading us. Okay, it's not a matter of dissuading or encouraging you. The reality is you have to know the reality. Know the reality, don't live in the optical delusion. Live in the reality. What is the reality? The reality I'll tell you. No matter how big a guru, no matter how big a guru blesses you, it's impossible that the next day you become a Nobel laureate in physics, 100% guaranteed. You agree with me or not? Nobody can bless you to become a Nobel laureate the next day. So if you want to become a Nobel laureate in physics, what should you do? You have to study physics. You're getting it? Study physics only, then you can expect to become a Nobel laureate in physics. Otherwise, if you live in the world of illusion, that or oh, seeking blessings, get some, get some empowerments, and tomorrow I'll become enlightened. If this is our belief, it's a self-deception. If, if it is that easy, Prince Siddharth, six years, he meditated. He went through this austere uh, practice and only then became enlightened. Not like when you guru and receive blessings and the next day become enlightened enlightened impossible so if you really want to be free from how many are fed up with these suffering these sufferings resents are you serious if you're serious resents and how you how many you want to get, get away from this resents yes if you really want to get away from this this is the only way study reflect and marry children emptiness there's no other way you're getting it there's no other way. Don't waste your time. Let's not forget it. I'm reiterating this. Don't waste your time simply by engrossing, believing that something else will give to give rise to liberation. It will never happen. First, study this, empty this, then you get you'll get a confidence. This is the only way. Look at his holiness of Dalai Lama, who is the fun authority in Buddhism. And he received teachings from all the different traditions. Sakya, Baitu, Yingma, all traditions. What advice does he give to us? Do you remember? Every time he says that, he receives all his highest empowerments, blessings, everything. But the advice that he gives us, that if you really take me as your teacher, practice the wisdom of emptiness and bodhicitta. This is the advice that he gives to us. Whereas, if he's the one who did not receive any of these blessings, empowerment, and so forth, and then he advises us to practice bodhicitta and wisdom and emptiness, then, oh, yeah, because he has not you know, seen the other traditions. He has seen the world of the traditions. And yet, the advice that he comes up with is that if you take me as your teacher, you study and practice wisdom and emptiness and bodhicitta. Let's not forget it. Let's not fall prey to the self-deception. You're getting it? If you really want to get away from the miseries of life, then say, for example, let's say that say if you in your family, if there is a the, if there's a fight happening in the family, if there's conflict happening in the family, it's so unhappy. Early morning you get up, your mind is already agitated. So much of pain. And if the, the family members say they are so close and you know so friendly, so close to, so close, again there's a pain. When is the pain? Hey, when is the pain? At the time of separation. The Buddha said, all meetings end in separation. All meetings end in separation. And all accumulation ends up in exhaustion. And all what is born deemed to be die, deemed to die. This is reality. So where the, the said in the family everything is so nice, so good, so supportive, friendly. At home separation, the pain is so acute. Whole life is shattered. You're getting it? You, you agree with me? It's acutely painful, acute painful. So, with this, now what's the solution? In a family, should we be, you know, nice to each other or not nice to each other? 
Not lunch to each other, it's worse. Every day you have to suffer. Every day. And you say you you may be bullying your, your family members. You may be bullying your family members. You may be bullying your mother. You may be bullying your father. You are so, what, pampered child. Extremely pampered child. Bullying your parents. Meanwhile, you get so much of negative karma that in your future lifetimes you will suffer terribly badly in the hell realms. This is what you do. You just unnecessary pains. It's a sadness in those two people who love you so much. Extremely sad. So, and then you think that you are the boss. But in deep inside you say that the, the same, what are you doing? You know, say this is your attitude towards your parents or towards your, towards your children. This is your attitude. So when you say, what are you doing? What's the feeling like? Is it pleasant or unpleasant? Very unpleasant. And if this is who you are, you go out, nobody will love you. They come to discover that this is who you are, your reality. You will not find a place in the world. Okay, so with this, with this, we see that then again, if the family is too nice, the children, they're so loving to the parents. I know here, some of the, the children, I know, your, your relationship with the parents is so beautiful. You respect the parents so much. You never, ever, in fact, I, I know some of you here, there, that you don't even think of taking a single money from your parents, although you're desperately in need of money. You just think of how to make my how to give money to my parents, how to support my parents, rather than how to take money from my parents. But some, they continue to extract, continue to extract, and meanwhile fight, keep fighting with the parents. This is so, so bad. So, so bad. This is what we have to change. Okay. But again, the problem is that if, the, if this is a relationship where the, the, student, the children are extremely nice to their parents, so kind, so considerate, of the parents again at the time of separation the pain is so much so what is the solution to this anyone what's the solution to this if the relationship is bad <clears throat> particularly amber child just bullying the parents and you become so much a negative karma and every day you are unhappy being so selfish and then when you are so loving to your parents again the time of separation is extremely painful so what's the way where lies the solution this is my question anybody where lies the solution yes love without attachment love without how do you do that right. with the love the love means attachment right uh -huh. good good thank you ben uh equanimity Okay, parents, you stay away. Right? We should have a balance. Right? I'm going to with the hair. Balance with the hair. Don't come too close to me. Right? I'll not also come not, not too close to you. Right? No, no, it's always better to embrace. Right? Give embrace to your mother. Don't say that I'm, I practice economy. Right? Embrace the mother. This is better. Right? Okay, but economy is far better than bullying your mother. Making the mother unhappy. Right? Mm -hmm. Some people they bully their mothers. Small children, some children, some young, in the 16, 17, 18, 19, they bully their parents. They make the parents every day unhappy. You become so much of negative karma. And then some 20s still bullying their parents. Some 30s, 40s still dependent on the parents financially. 40s still dependent on the parents and then keep bullying the parents. What a shame. So what's the solution? I said non attachment. Non attachment. Okay, no, I'm not just with the mother anymore. Okay. Huh? Not the attachment, non attachment. So this means like you can enjoy, you can be with them, but you don't have any expectations. And how do you do that? So it comes really from from um from a. But you know, say they, I love you, mom, but the mom says I'm I'm practicing non attachment. <laughs> And you will not enjoy it. How can you enjoy? I think you can enjoy because... No, the mother is not reacting to you. 
right? Mother says, I'm practicing non-attachment, right? And you are saying, I love you, mom. I mean, enjoy- I want to enjoy. But mom says, no, please stay away. <laughs> then? This is not what I mean. I mean okay. It's like, not the attachment, I'm talking about non-attachment. So you can fully express your feelings, fully express your love, also receive it, but you don't have any expectations. How, 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 how? This is the problem. Everybody wants to do that, but it's not happening. So how to make it happen? Because you have realized the things how they are. So like you have, what? You, have you are a mother? You have that you know, I realized that you are a mother. Yes. This is a reality. So I love you. Yeah, but right? I cannot stay away from you. The reality is that the mother is empty of inherent nature. Okay. So you can practice this so you can still enjoy and you can even enjoy more without not attachment because like the chocolate cake. So you can have the cake without attachment, you know. Okay, you know say the say the, if the attachment to the, the the say the the chocolate cake, if you know that is you are coming from your mind, then you you cannot enjoy it. Okay, enjoy the chocolate cake. Imagine the chocolate cake. Enjoy it. Yeah. Can you enjoy it? Yes. Okay. Which is which more? Imagination the enjoy the okay, then breakfast you'll enjoy it? Yeah. Breakfast. Don't go to the kitchen. Just imagine breakfast. <laughs> yes. Yeah, but it's not only that you just realize that it's empty of human nature. It doesn't mean that it doesn't exist. Uh. So because you can still feel So it. basically you will see that the same the uh, same uh, the things which create problem to you. When you see that they enter your system, your mind feels at peace. It stops reacting. Likewise when you see the chocolate cake also as coming from your mind, your mind will stop reacting to it. So the enjoyment is not there. How do you explain this? Yes, here. Uh, what do you say? Your name? Manu. 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 Mm-hmm. What Manu said is very important. Let's not forget it. What she said is very important. So I'm, I'm challenging her, not because it is something to be challenged. I'm seeing how far she can go, right? You went pretty well. <laughs> yes. Uh, I was going to say, uh, I'm assuming the influence of the situation that your mother would be there, but sometimes you will separate as well, like understanding the reality. Uh, if it's impermanent, there is going to be a time that we separate, there is a time that we will move on, and things will change. Okay, mom, now don't be too attached to me. One day we'll be separated, right? Then it's going to be very painful, still a little, but we think about impermanence, right? Still a little away. Which means that it will stop you from enjoying this affection, no? Oh, so you know impermanence? I have no idea. Huh? No, no. understanding that at some point. Okay, so basically, what the when Chunzumla, what Chunzumla is saying, all composite things are impermanent. This is what the Buddha taught. Then the next line is, all contaminated things are suffering from nature. Then the next one is, everything is the nature of the surface. This is how we upgrade ourselves, upgrade our realizations from the first level to the second to the third to the fourth. You're getting it? So what? The Allah said is very true. The first we have to think about the impermanence. Think about impermanence. So then say oftentimes are attached to your parents, children, your what husband, wife, whatever. So this is oftentimes because the underlying that is the belief in impermanent phenomena is permanent. This belief. When the separation happens, then you discover that the foundation is shaken, that it's not permanent. You believe it to be permanent, but it's not permanent, then the whole feeling of this affection is shaken and it transpires into sadness and agitation. So this meditation is extremely important. Okay, now do you agree with me? What you want is that what each one of us want, particularly when you're so loving, caring towards your parents, when you're so loving and caring towards your children, oftentimes I've the although I don't really fully agree with Charles Darwin's evolutionary theory, but what he said is just amazing. 
Buddha said it's amazing. What is the purpose of the evolution? What is that? Is what? Anybody? Anyone? The two doctors? What's the purpose of evolution? According to him. Just to survive the species. You getting it? Just to survive the species. How to survive the full survival of the species? Who is important? Parents or the children? Children are important. So therefore, the parents love the children because the children, they will continue with the species. And the parents want the children, they come into existence, the parents' job is done. You are redundant. Right? So, yes, this is exactly how the world operates. Like animals. Then the parents, they love the children so much. I remember this boy. This boy, Yingsil, when he was just very little, the mother, even in the daytime, was sleeping with him because he wants to sleep and he said, I want mother to be with him. This is, you know, how the mother raised this child. So now how he is behaving, I don't know. I don't know. But this is how the mother raised I've seen this boy, how this mother they say the, she did not want to sleep, but she was there just to make him sleep there. This is how we get, got so much love and affection from this mother. Now I would say that if he behaves badly, this is terrible. He should behave nicely. He should be kind to his mother, to the parents. This is so important. So what I'm saying is that there's so much love and affection there. They're so beautiful. And Charles Allen said, yes, the parents should parents love their children. This by nature. Children may not love the, the parents. Because the parents, they, they're absolute. This is what the Charles Allen said. But the Buddha said it very differently. Every being is precious. Whether you are old, young, it doesn't matter. Every being is precious. Not that the purpose is not just for the survival of the species. The purpose is to awaken your true nature inside. True nature inside, this is not what Charles Darwin touched. He did not even have a clue of this. The true nature of your mind. So precious. So for the Buddha, the purpose of life is not to survive, not to survive a species, but to discover your true nature within so that you experience fearlessness and infinite happiness. Okay, so there, the point is that the, um, the, you love so much to children, and children, they don't love the parents as much. But some people, amazing, their love towards the parents is just amazing, unparalleled. And those of us who don't feel that, we must learn from others who show exemplary Say the who are being exemplary in ways of giving love to their parents. This is amazing and precious. Okay, so with this, there are two things. This love and affection is so beautiful. So beautiful, for example, like the children. When they come from the school, bullied by elder children, elder students, elder children. When they come home, they see their parents, they just feel as though like every cell of the body relaxes to see the mother. You feel so safe, secure, extremely relaxed. So there's tremendous affection here. It is so beautiful. At the same time, with the separation, there's a pain happening. The pain is acute, acute painful. Nobody wants it. So this is the, the thing. When the love and affection increases, pain also increases. When you reduce the pain, love and affection also reduces. So, if there is a situation, if I give you a situation where, in the case of somebody who does feel this love and affection, acute love and affection towards a mother, towards a father, towards the children, so this love and affection, if you have it, I will give three options and you choose one of them. One is where you have tremendous love and affection and tremendous pain. This, I don't have to give you, you already have it. Right, so much love and affection. Where you feel so much love and affection during the separation, there's so much pain. Number one. Number two, no love, no pain. What is that? This English expression. Huh? Huh? No pain, no gain. Right? 
Okay, one, there's so much love and affection and so much of pain. This one scenario. Second scenario, no love, no, no, no pain. Right? Third scenario, full of love and affection with no pain. Okay, tell me, which do you want? Number three. Number three. Is it doable? This is a question. Is it doable? Manu said yes. Very positive. Answer is yes. This is 100% possible. So, so for that, think of emptiness. Manu said, who else? Somebody has also said it. Bodhi said it. Okay, somebody said it. Manu and who? Here? Yes, the Ben. Okay. So, the emptiness. Emptiness is not nothingness. Emptiness is not, not nothingness. Um, emptiness, it is like emptiness and dependent origination. These are the two sides of the same coin. Two sides of the same coin. Emptiness and dependent origination. Same. From one side you see emptiness. Other side you see dependent origination. Nihilism. One side you see nihilism. Other side is nihilism. That's it. Whereas with emptiness, one side you see emptiness, other side you see dependent origination. You're getting it? By seeing emptiness, the pains will go away. <laughs> You're getting it? By seeing emptiness, by seeing emptiness, the pain will go away. By seeing dependent origination, your affection grows. You're getting it? It's a beautiful thing. If the pain goes away and your affection also goes away, this is nihilism. This is not emptiness. If the, pain go, if the pain goes away and you become more indifferent towards your family members, you'll be more detached, indifferent, which means most likely you are falling into nihilism. It's not the genuine emptiness. So, the same, the two sides are the same coin. Emptiness on one hand and the other side is the dependent origination. How many, how many of you use the tea strainer? Raise hands. How many of you use tea strainer? Raise hands, raise hands. Okay. Okay. The Farizal explain what is tea strainer? Tea strainer. Pablo, what is tea strainer in Spain? Okay. How many Spanish here? Pablo, Maria. How many Spanish? There, here. What is tea strainer, Jonathan? Okay, say it louder so the others can hear. Maria can hear. Huh? Colaro de te. Colaro or holaro? Colaro. Colaro de te. Okay, tea strainer. Okay, now for example, what is the, how do you explain tea strainer? What's the job of that? Okay, let us all listen to. <laughs> Some tea not masculine. Right? Okay, so the, what Farizal is saying, do you agree with Farizal that a tea strainer is like uh, the, say, with the sieve there, you put the tea leaves and you put hot water in it, and the drinkable tea will be, you know, it will flow freely. And what is not drinkable is hold back. It's held back. It's held back. Okay. The negative emotions will be held back by the, with the tea strain of emptiness. The tea strain of emptiness, it let flow all the virtuous qualities very flow, the flow freely. It will let the virtuous thoughts, compassion, love, affection, this tea strain of emptiness will let these virtuous thoughts flow, flow freely in your mind. And yet, it holds back the pains which you dislike. It holds back and stops all the pains. This is the tea strain of the wisdom of emptiness. 
By seeing emptiness, all your pains are stopped. By seeing dependent origin, other sign, dependent origination, all your virtues will flow freely. You're getting it? This is a benefit. If this is not happening, where you practice the wisdom of emptiness, and if this is not happening, something is wrong. Which means what you what you're meditating is not actually emptiness, it is most likely nihilism. Let's not, let's not forget it. Okay. So to understand, for for this matter, how many you how many if what I said thus far, if it is true, then the uh, the what the point that that came to your mind, it hits your mind, is that okay, I should take the wisdom of emptiness very seriously. Okay, how many of you this thought came to you now, reasons that I have to take wisdom of emptiness very seriously? If I'm to get away from this pain, reasons. Good. Okay. So for that matter, we have to have extensive studies of wisdom of emptiness. And we can't imagine that in one week, all the two days gone. No, another, including today, five days more. So in five days, we can't imagine to go extensively into emptiness, extensively into bodhicitta, right? But at least we'll have some idea of what we learn something about what emptiness is, and that should be taken as a key, as a key for us to unfold more of the extensive studies in the future. In other words, don't stop your the studies don't stop don't stop them are the engage in more extensive studies this is the message okay for emptiness um, to really understand what emptiness is one can easily fall prey to nihilism so to stop this from happening what is important is that we have to begin with two questions we have to begin with two questions the first question is do things exist do things exist? If the answer is no, you fall into nihilism. This is not emptiness. You're getting it? First question is, do things exist? If ever in future, if ever in the future, in the process of you studying, reflecting and meditating on emptiness, if ever the thought comes to you that, okay, so with emptiness, nothing's there. If that comes to you, remember this first question. What's the first question? Do things exist? Answer is yes. If the answer is no, this is not emptiness, this is nihilism. Let's not forget it, number one. Only if your answer is yes to the first question, yes, do things do exist, then you are eligible to give answer to the second question. Second question is, do things exist objectively? Answer is no. So when you say no to the second question, yes to the first question, no to the second question, answer that you give to the second question goes in line with emptiness. You're getting it? So whereas if you say yes, it does exist objectively, you'll fall into absolutism. You fall into the extreme of absolutism. So the first one, if you say no, things don't exist, you fall into nihilism, extreme of nihilism. But the second question is, do things exist objectively? If your answer is yes, things exist objectively, you fall into the extreme of absolutism. Okay, so to make sure that emptiness is the middle way, it is not the extremes. You must be free from the two extremes, extreme of nihilism and extreme of absolutism. Okay, with this, um, to make it even clearer, we need to know that emptiness is not nihilism. Emptiness is the meaning of dependent origination. Emptiness is the meaning of dependent origination. Okay. Emptiness meaning of dependent origination. In other words, emptiness equals dependent origination. Number two, dependent origination equals the middle way. You're getting it? Emptiness equals dependent origination and the dependent origination equals the middle way. A equals B, B equals C. What is next? A equals C. You're getting it? So my job is to explain to you how A equals B and how B equals C and your job is to tell me, hey, 
how A equals C. You're getting it? So my job is to tell you how A equals B, B equals C, and your job is to tell me how, therefore, how A equals C. Are you good? So, okay, now in the meaning, in the actual meaning, you tell me. My job is to tell you how emptiness equals dependent origination and how dependent origination equals the middle way. And your job is to tell me how emptiness means the middle way. Very good. Thank you. Okay, what's the first job? How emptiness equals? Dependent origination. For this, we have to know five points. And five points, five points as I explain, as I reiterate these, what these five points are, then you will come to know, this is so, it's so simple. But, as I said earlier, this is all, this is all a matter of name, of cumulative information. These small things will be accumulated and over time those who those two took for granted. That's very easy. That's very easy. Nothing is accumulated. And then later on when I say the entity goes dependent on origination, how you get stuck, you get lost there. And earlier you thought it's too easy. Yes, it's very easy. But I think you have to remember these points. Okay. When I was in class 11, my maths teacher, he shared a story with us. And the, in those days, even among the staff of the school, the teachers, the school, owning a car was unheard of. And perhaps this teacher must be, must be the first teacher to own a car. And he he is amazingly, amazing, wonderful person. And uh, he shared a story. Once his car broke and he took the car to the mechanic. And they, he asked, they, uh, so the mechanic, he just looked at the engine and finally he, he hit his hammer three times to the engine, ta, ta, ta. And then he started the car, it worked perfectly well. Then the, my teacher, math, math, the maths teacher, he asked the mechanic, how much should I pay you? In those days, 100 rupees equals like today, like 10,000 rupees. 10,000 rupees is like how much dollar? How many dollars? 10,000 rupees. 10,000 dollars. 120, okay. Let's say 120 dollars, you know, 120 dollars. So, um, uh, three, say 300 rupees is like 30,000 dollars. 30,000 rupees. What is it like? 360 dollars. How costly is that? Very expensive. So he hit the hammer three times, ta, 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 and charged him three hundred and sixty dollars. Right? Three hundred thousand, three hundred, no, thirty thousand rupees. In those days, like three hundred rupees, it's very expensive. And my teacher was surprised. How come that you charged me? Just you hit three, three times the, the hammer three times. And you charge 300 rupees. One hammer, hitting one hammer is just 100, 100 rupees. So expensive. He said that hitting the hammer is free for you. He said that I hit, I hit the hammer three times to your car. That's my effort, to, my effort that I put to hit uh, the, your engine with three, the three times with the hammer. That's free. I'm not charging you for that. But I'm charging for where to hit. <laughs> I'm not charging for me hitting it. I'm hitting because I know where to hit. This is what I'm charging you for. You're getting it. So likewise, what we're learning, all these things seem to be very simple, but later on, you will get lost if you are not careful where to, you know, where to hit. You're getting it. So this is what we have to learn. Don't just think that 
But that's easy, you know. I thought it was very complicated. Right? And later on, those who underestimated, later on, most likely those who underestimate emptiness, you will not study emptiness extensively. Without doing this, later on, somebody talks about emptiness, you have something to say. But when you meditate, you have nothing experience happening. Okay. So, what am I supposed to be sharing with you? How emptiness equals? Dependent origination. Okay. So for that, how many points are there? Five points. Five points are all very easy. But if you miss one point, then you will find the, you will you will end up having missing links. With the missing links, you cannot have the flow of emptiness. Okay. So the what are the five points? The first one is emptiness. First one is emptiness. Number two. Emptiness is not nothingness. Number two, emptiness is a short form of emptiness of independent existence. Emptiness is a short form of emptiness of independent existence. Number two, emptiness is a short form of emptiness of independent existence. Number two. <clears throat> okay, how many of you know who? Raise your hands. How many of you know who? You don't know who? Huh? Huh? Government. Huh? World Health Organization. When somebody asks you where is who, it doesn't mean who's who. You're getting it? It's simply asking what is the full form of the who? World Health Organization. Likewise, emptiness. It is a short form of emptiness of independent existence. Who? Don't say take who as who. Who is who? Who is what? What is who? What is a short form of World Health Organization. Likewise, emptiness is a short form of emptiness of independent existence. Number two. Number three. Emptiness of independent existence means nothing exists independently. Number three. Nothing exists independently. So all should be connected. The first one should be connected with the second. Second one should be connected with the third. So the second one we said that that it is of emptiness, a short form of emptiness of independent existence. So emptiness of independent existence means number three, nothing exists independently. Number three. Number four, if nothing exists independently, then Number four, everything exists by? Hey, louder. If nothing exists independently, then everything exists by? Dependence. Very good. This is number four. That everything exists by dependence, number four. If everything exists by dependence, dependence, then everything is dependently originated. Number five. Everything is dependently originated. Okay, what is number one? Emptiness. What is number two? That emptiness is a short form of emptiness of independent existence. What is number three? Everything is empty of independent existence means nothing exists independently. What is number four? If nothing exists independently, it means everything exists by dependence. What is number five? If everything is independent existence, then everything is dependently originated. So from these five lines of reasoning, we come to deduce that emptiness means the dependent origination. You're getting it? Okay, so the first job is done. What's the second job? Tenzing said, what's the second job? Huh? Yundela, what's the second job? Louder? Huh? What's the second job? Anyone? Namsala. What's the second job? Louder. How dependent the origination is in the middle of Is this the second job? Raise your hands. Okay. And instead of what's the second job? Very good. How dependent the origination equals the middle way, right? Okay. How is dependent origination equal to the middle way? 
So for this, we need to know two things. Dependent origination, it has two sides. Dependence and origination. There are two things. Dependence and origination. The first one, dependence. When we say dependence, was the opposite of dependence? Independence. independence. When you say dependence, it rejects independence. When you say dependence, it rejects independence. And independent existence and absolute existence, these two mean the same. Independent existence and absolute existence, these two mean the same. When you reject independent existence, you reject the absolute existence. So in other words, by dependence, it rejects the extreme of absolutism. The first part, dependence, it rejects the extreme of absolutism, of the two extremes. The first is done. Now what is next? Origination. So dependent origination, dependent, it, by dependence, by knowing the first one, depend, dependence, it, reject, it helps to reject the extreme of absolutism. So next part is origination. When you say origination, do you agree with me that origination means something comes into origination, something comes into existence. What's the opposite of existence? Non-existence, non nihilism. So origination, it extremes, it, ex it rejects the extreme of nihilism, non-existence. Dependence, it rejects the extreme of absolutism. Origination, it rejects the extreme of nihilism. Bringing the two together, dependent origination, bringing the two together, rejects the two extremes. Reject, rejecting the two extremes is following the... Hey, louder. Rejecting the two extremes is following the middle way. Okay, let me say this again. Dependent origination, it has... And the... It means middle way. How? Dependent origination has two sides. What are they? What are they? Dependent and origination. The first one, dependent. When I say dependent, it rejects what? It rejects absolutism because it rejects independence. Rejects absolutism. And the origination, it rejects what? Nihilism. Bringing the two together, Independent origin two together, it rejects the two extremes. Rejecting the two extremes is following the middle way. This is how dependent origination is the middle way. You're getting it? Okay, here, question. Okay, absolutism means absolute, absolute, independent. Say, oh, again, yeah, I'm absolutely right. Right? I'm the, the, the I'm absolutely right, right? Which means that how I how I'm being right, how I'm being correct, is so absolute, is ultimate, so ultimate, absolute, independent. They all mean the same. Okay, okay. Which country? Switzerland. And the what's your language? German or French? Is there any French here? Yes, what is absolutism in French? Absolutism. Huh? Is it the proper French? Or you created it? <laughs> is there any French? Any other French? Here. Yeah. Uh, it's the same English. It is it, meaning. Okay, don't worry. Absolutism is it simply means independence. Independence, something which is independent existent. In reality, there's nothing existing independently. Everything exists by dependence. For the time being, you say absolutism means something existing independently. It rejects the extreme of independence. Good. Okay. So from this we come to learn that. Emptiness equals dependent origination and dependent origination means the middle way. Therefore, emptiness means the middle way. You getting it? Okay. So having said this, the next part is that we have to know a little bit about what dependent origination is. So from this, in future, 
Although we learn all these things, but during your, if you are very serious with the studies and reflection, you are bound to come with, come up with some thoughts, some kind of, of the, say the conviction. I don't know whether it's um, the genuine conviction, um, the feeling like a confidence that things don't exist. When that ever happens, remember how emptiness means dependent origination, how dependent origin means the middle way. Therefore, emptiness is not nihilism. Emptiness is the middle way. Let's not forget it. And also, let's not forget the first two questions. What are the two questions? Do things exist? Second question. Do things exist objectively? Right? Let's not forget these two questions. Okay. So for that, um, the the dependent origination, dependent origin, this concept is extremely important, and oftentimes uh, dependent origination is referred to as the, the the king of the reasoning, king of the reasons to establish emptiness. Dependent origination as the king of the reasons to establish emptiness is considered so precious. In fact, I remember my teacher, Venerable Geshe Wanjin Rinpoche, they say when in my 20s, when in my 20s, I always um, you know, either go to my teacher, Venerable Geshe, Geshe Pandita Rinpoche, or Geshe Wanjin Rinpoche. I go to them to ask questions on emptiness. When I ask a lot of questions on emptiness to my teacher, Venerable Geshe Wanjin Rinpoche, and uh, then the uh, say the they being the giants of the philosophy and highly realized the yogis of emptiness and at one point so when it comes to dependent origination uh, related to the concept of emptiness they, he just very spontaneously he just gestures gestured his, his hand like this saying that oh i take refuge in dependent origination it came so spontaneous to him that is such a great example that I'm seeing with my own eyes that how deeply he could he's convinced of dependent origination to see emptiness. That's amazing, great inspiration. So dependent origination is, is extremely important for us to know. And even okay, I'm a little con confused, getting confused between the very centers. So I just mix up with the Deer Park Center now. Deer Park Center. There at the the main statue is Adamanjushri. So I was looking at Adamanjushri there. Okay, but the, where? Yes, here yes, yeah. to my to our right side. What is that? To your left side. To my right side. Adamanjushri. In fact, Lama Tsongkhapa, who's the mantra we recite every morning, Mimetsa with the Jinjirasi. When he was going through the emptiness experience. Uh, he was. He wanted to verify, evaluate if his understanding of emptiness is a genuine understanding. And um, that that time there was one teacher by the name Lama Umapa, and that teacher happened to have happened to have the pure vision of Aramajushri. He could meet with Aramajushri and ask questions, and Aramajushri gives the answers. This was what used to happen between. Aramanjushri and Lama Umapa. And Lama Umapa and Lama Tsongkhapa, two of them, the relationship is like mutual teacher student relationship. So both of them receive teachings from each other. They are like mutual te teacher student. Given that Lama, Lama Umapa had access to Aramanjushri directly, but at that point, Lama Tsongkhapa, he did not, he did not have the access to Aramanjushri. Who he requested Lama Umapa uh, to ask this question to Aramanjushri whether or not his understanding of emptiness is the genuine understanding of emptiness according to Prasangika Madhimika. Then Aramanjushri responded that no, it is not the Prasangika's emptiness experience, but if you put effort in three factors, one, subligating to your guru to be seen as one with the meditational deity number one number two 
and the say the the go through the extensive to do extensive studies of the commentaries on emptiness written by the Indian masters, past Indian masters. Number two. Number three, that if you engage in the extensive accumulation of merit and clearing the clearing away the or purifying the negativities with these three factors, very soon you will realize the very pure the say, form of the emptiness according to Prasangika. So this is a prophecy made by Arimanjushri to uh, Lama Tsungapa through Lama Umapa. Okay, so the point is that the um, the need for Lama Tsung and then more advice were given by Arimanjushri to Lama Tsungapa. One is pertaining to how he should respect the understanding of dependent origination to understand emptiness well. So therefore, emptiness, the dependent origination is ref referred to as the, the king of the reasonings. Dependent origination as the king of the reasoning to establish emptiness. So, um, the Buddha in this, the Blaze of non dual Bodhicittas, the brown book, the Blaze of non dual Bodhicittas, there's, of course, this is extremely precious book. I told you last time, you will never find this book anywhere in the world. So, this is so precious. And then all the important sources, I would say not all, in America, if you say all, and something's missing, you'll be sued. So I would say most of the important texts which you require are all in. Most of them are all here in this book. Okay, so the Rise Seedling Sutra, Sutra on Dependent Origination, Rise Seedling Sutra, Asalistamba Sutra, is also included in this book. So there, the Buddha taught, whosoever sees dependent origination will see the Dharma. Whosoever sees the Dharma will see the Buddha. Let's not forget it. Whosoever sees dependent origination will see the Dharma. Whosoever sees the Dharma will see the Buddha. One. Number two, the Buddha said, because this exists, that exists. Because this is produced, that is produced. Number two. Number three. Because of ignorance, karma is created. Because of karma, consciousness is created. Because of which, name and form is created. Because of which, the sources are created. Because of which, the context is created. Feelings, attachment, grasping, becoming, birth, aging and death is created. And then the Buddha further explained, when ignorance ceases, karma ceases, because of which, the consciousness ceases because of which name and form ceases because of which the senses, the, the sources, the sources, the contact, the feelings, attachment, grasping, becoming, birth, and the aging and death ceases. Okay, this is what the Buddha taught. So I'm going to quickly explain on these the, the first part. What is the first part? Whosoever sees dependent origination will see the Dharma, and who, whosoever sees the Dharma will see the Buddha. So when he, it doesn't mean that whosoever sees Dharma, you will see me. This is not a contradiction. Whosoever sees the Dharma will you will become a Buddha. This is the, the, the message. Okay. What the second part. <laughs> because this exists, that exists, because this is produced, that is produced. This is number two. Verse number three, because of ignorance, how the how samsara evolves, and how the samsara stops. How samsara evolves is that because of ignorance, karma is created. Because of karma, consciousness is created. The name and name and form, the senses, the contact, the feelings, attachment, grasping, becoming, birth, aging, and death is created. Then the reverse of this, or uh, the the stopping the stopping samsara. If ignorance is stopped, the karma stops, because of which then the twelve links stop. Your samsara stops. Okay. Um, so dependent origination. Whoever sees dependent origination will see the dharma. What is dependent origination? What is the dharma and what is the buddha? You will stop here. <clears throat> Dear Tom, oh
गते गते पार गते पार संगते बोधी स्वाता ओम गते गते पार गते पार संगते बोधी स्वाता ओम गते गते पार गते पार संगते बोधी स्वा